Okay, in this video I'd like to discuss something called wave particle duality or Bohr's complementarity principle. And I'm going to pitch this at somebody that a level of somebody who's in school perhaps or first or second year in college, but definitely not somebody who's done a course in quantum physics or, or anything like that. Perhaps I suppose if you're not if you're struggling in quantum physics this might help. I don't know. Anyway, the first thing I'd like to discuss is a thing called a model. Now this is crucial to your understanding of wave particle duality. Science, in particular physics, is all about creating a model to explain physical occurrences or physical phenomena. And the thing about these things is it's just a model. It means that science can never say it is. It cannot do that. All it can do is say it oh that's that's an S. It is like. Alright? Because we can only say it is like something, we can never say what it is. And you might say, well, why can we never say what something is? Well, we are restricted. We are restricted by the fact that we are human. Uh, the fact that our experience is, is limited to things on Earth. The fact that we are trying to use a language to, to describe something. And you'll find that physical phenomena aren't human, they don't need experience, they, sorry, they don't, um, they don't correspond to human experience and they certainly don't use language. So we're trying to pigeonhole something which doesn't really get pigeonholed. It's like putting, uh, if you have a circular hole and trying to put in a square peg sort of stuff. It's, all you can say it's like a square but it's not really. But anyway, I'll talk about that in a moment. So we're trying to get a model, we're trying to say it behaves like something which we know, and the thing we know, of course, is on Earth. And just to point out, things on Earth are, by comparison, large to the ty types of things I'll be discussing in this, as in ridiculously large. So it's it wouldn't it's not necessarily um, reasonable to assume that just the way because things behave a certain way for humans who are large, that they should behave the same way for things that are small, which we could never possibly see or understand. All right. So, like I said, a model is about what it is like, not what it is. And everything is a model. Now, what is wave particle duality? This is a model trying to explain the behavior of light. Okay, or electromagnetic radiation, but that's beside the point. So we'll say it's trying to behave, uh, trying to explain the behavior of light. And it's trying to behave, it explains light because it says that light is like a wave and it is like a particle at the same time. That's why we say there is complementarity in it. Okay? Now note, of course, that it's like. We don't, we don't understand it at all. But we understand things called waves, which I'll speak about in a moment. And we understand things called particles. And it happens that light behaves kind of like both of those. But that does not mean at all. Light is not a wave, and light is not a particle. Light is not something with wave-particle duality. Absolutely not. What I'm saying is, it behaves like it, and the reason it behaves like it is because we are restricted to human experience, to the fact that we're human, to languages, and all these sorts of things. And light isn't restricted by any of those things. So we need to explain it in a way which we understand, and it's not necessarily the case necessarily the case, excuse me, that we, w w that we can possibly understand light. All right? So it's all about a model and uh, coming up with ways to describe it. And we're only describing it. So what are the ways we're describing it as? Well, we say, first of all, light is a wave. All right? Now, I'll tell you what a wave is first. If you had two sticks like this, and in between them you, you strung a string. All right? And you wave the string up and you wave the string down you get a, a wave. Something we all have seen, like a skipping rope, is a wave. Now, that's grand, and we knew a couple of hundred years ago about the propagation of sound, and sound moves through the air like a wave. And we studied that pretty um, intensive, or in, extensively, and as a result we knew all about waves. And when we came along with, uh, to describing light, we found that light behaved similarly. However, in say that this case, the wave is propagating or moving through the string, we found that light doesn't need a medium, so light just propagates through empty space. However, it still propagates as a wave, or propagates like 
wave. All right, it, we found that if we analysed light as if it was a wave, our results were reasonably good. So the model of light being as a, as a wave was pretty good. All right, and that was that really for quite a long time, in fact. Well, there were, there were debates as whether there was other things, but that's beside the point. And it was kind of, we'll say at the turn of the 20th century, it was pretty much said that light was a particle, or excuse me, light was a wave, and that's it. That we know what light is, it's a wave. But then, of course, other things started happening, and we found that the, the model we required in order to explain light was the fact that it was a particle. Now, what do I mean by that? By that, I mean that we're literally talking about small little packets of light, individual packets, where you can only get one packet. You can't get half a packet, three quarters of a packet, but that there is a minimum size of light, and we call it this minimum size a quantum, and the quantum of light is the photon. So you can only get one photon, you can get two, three or four, but you cannot get three quarters, one and three quarters, 0.5 of a photon, you can't get that. So you come as a minimum size of particle. And yeah, it behaves like a particle, it behaves like snooker balls, we'll say, as in you get things like collisions, you have, you know, we have velocities and all this sorts of thing. We found that it's behavior, or excuse me, explaining light in the model that it was a particle, we had, when it had a quantum of light called a photon, then it, that it was reasonably good at explaining some things. For example, there was this thing called the photoelectric effect. Who, by the way, Einstein was against the whole quantum thing, right? He didn't believe that. And it's strange that Einstein was the man, as far as I know, that uh, he, was, he was behind the photoelectric effect, which is the principal thing to do, that um, kind of backs up the whole uh, particle particle um, behaviour of light. Anyway, so basically what the photoelectric effect said was if you have a piece of metal and you shine a light on it and you have a wire coming out of it or something on those lines and the point is anyway that if you shine the shine light on it and there's my light going down to it that electrons would come off alright, like we'll say electricity would come off it and the only time the electrons will come off is if the the uh, the strength of the the light was strong enough, or it's in not its intense intensity, its um its energy was strong enough. Now we're talking about the the particular energy of a particular photon, all right? And obviously, if you shined more photons of that same energy, you would get more electrons coming off. However, if the light you shined was less than this energy, if it was less than, so we have, I'm just going to draw this here, we'll say I'll draw it in black, and just say I'm going to draw a smaller line to say it's less energy, then we got no photons, no photons whatsoever came off. And if we decided, well, what if we shine more, so the overall amount of energy landing would be more absolutely we got no electrons none so the point was that there was a minimum energy required to release an electron and oh, and if you increased the amount of those uh, energies falling on it you'd get more electrons however if the energy was less than the the minimum then no matter how many more pieces of energy shined on it that were less you would never get an, a, an electron so what they said was this just to, to put this into I suppose English really they said that the photons which were in the light had a, a minimum energy, right? Each. And that the, the, in the metal you had a thing called a work function, which was the minimum energy work function. And that was the minimum energy to release your uh, electron. And unless the photon had an equal amount of energy, exactly equal amount of energy to the work function, that you, then you got no, um, you got no uh, electrons. And this was at odds to the wave, um, the wave kind of nature of light. Wave, if you dealt this situation as if light was a wave, then you would get no results. You wouldn't be able to work it out at all. So we found that in order to work out this particular scenario, we needed to treat light as a wave. So does that mean that light is a wave and light is a particle? Absolutely not. It means that light behaves sometimes like a wave, sometimes like, like a particle, and is neither. Now you might say, well, how does it behave sometimes like one thing and sometimes like another? 
Well, I'll try and explain this to you. Imagine if, in your society, you knew of bicycles and automobiles. These were the form of, forms of transport with which you were familiar. That's it. And somehow you were observing something else from, a, from an alien planet, or whatever it was, and it was a tricycle. No, take that back. It's not a tricycle. It's a motorbike. Now, let's just think. What are the properties of bicycles? Well, they have wheels. They have handlebars. They have... What else would they have? Um, they would have a saddle. Okay, we'll just say three. What are the properties of automobiles? They have engines. They usually have seats. They have speedometers, we'll say. Whatever, it doesn't really matter, but we'll say that these are three or six um, six properties. So if you so if you wanted to find out if something was a bicycle, you would say, well, does it have a wheel? And you'd say yes. Okay, well, does it have a handlebar? Well, yes it does. Does it have a saddle? Yes it does. Therefore it's a bicycle. And you'd say, well, what if you said, well, let's test to see if it is if it is um, an automobile and you test for these three here. So what happens if we test these properties on our motorbike? So if we, look, if we decided one day we're going to test for the properties of a bicycle, we'd find the motorbike has wheels. Would we find it has handlebars? Yes, we would. And would we find it has a saddle? No, we wouldn't. Alright? So you'd find that a motorbike, saying that it is a bicycle, is a reasonable description or a reasonable model. All right. However, what if we said, is it an automobile? And you say, well, does it have an engine? Yes. Does it have seats? Yeah, it has a seat. And uh, it does have a speedometer. So it has the properties of an automobile. So it must be an automobile. All right. However, this study was done on two separate parts of the earth. One guy said it was an automobile, and the other guy tested for the fact that it was a bicycle. And people said, well, they said this, they said a motorbike is, or behaves, excuse me, behaves like a bicycle. And then they read in a, they read in a journal or something that the, some other guys doing something that said a motorbike behaves like an automobile. And they look at each other's results and they say, hold on a second, no, no, I found that it behaved like a motorbike, and, or excuse me, like a bicycle. And some guy said, no, no, it behaves like an automobile. And both are correct, both are correct. So what they would have to say is that the motorbike behaves like a bicycle and an automobile. Now the point is that they don't understand they don't understand what a motorbike is. This is an alien concept to them. So they can only describe the motorbike in terms of which they understand. And they understand bicycles and they understand automobiles. Alright? But are, is this statement correct? Well it behaves like a bicycle and an automobile. That is perfectly correct. The motorbike is a bicycle and an automobile. That is absolutely incorrect. That is not the case. It is not a bicycle and it is not an automobile. It is a mix or it's a hybrid of both. And the complementarity principle is quite similar. In that, if you look for the properties of a wave, if you try and anal analyze the situation looking for the properties of a wave, then you will find that the wave is up. The wave comes up trumps. You'll say, yeah, wave. Wave works. Perfect. Then sometimes you say, hold up a second. This wave analysis doesn't work and you have to go for a particle. And you know something that might be trumps, but you need both. And is it, is it both? Is it one? Is it the other? The answer is no, it's none of those. It's actually something which we can't possibly understand. But it behaves like. And the model we are currently using to explain it, the model we use to explain light, is wave particle duality. Alright? That's what that means. So, 
I hope that's a reasonable introduction to wave particle duality or complementarity. Um, but it is a bit mad. There are some things which are like literally uh, just above human comprehension as far as I'm concerned. Things which you could never possibly think of um, about, we'll say, the quantum of the quantum behavior of things. Okay, and this all this all I suppose began with the wave particle duality of light. Um, yeah, properties like and just just to, just to kind of to give you an example of why the fact that we don't understand any of these things or po couldn't possibly uh, that everything has a everything has a probability of being anywhere any anywhere at all like as in uh, okay I'll give an example now more everything has a probability of being anywhere however this probability depends on your mass so something with a large mass the probability of being anywhere would be slim but the probability of being anywhere for something with a small mass would be high so an electron or a photon for example photon has no mass would have a probability of being anywhere in space all right so now of course what that means is your hand right now although that is a large mass a comparatively large mass there is a non-zero probability that if you punch the wall and you keep punching the wall, eventually you will go through it. Now, that's the thing about being anywhere. It's able to, the, the thing is called tunneling. Uh, is it two L's? I think it's two L's. I'm not too sure. Tunneling. All right. And the point is this. While it's non-zero, but almost zero for your hand, it is non-zero and high for electrons, we'll say. And to show that it's not pie in the sky, this principle here is used in things called electron mic microscopes. It's used in loads of things. The fact that you tunnel is used in plenty of our uh, electronics nowadays. But it's just to show like these things are strange. We're, we, we're trying to put English and explain as a human and so on things which we probably can never do. So like I said, that was my, excuse me, that was my introduction to wave particle duality. Thanks for watching. Please pass it on to your friends and subscribe to my channel.